Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Bush. I'm the DNA supervisor. Uh, I've got a little outline up front here or up on the screen right now as far as the areas we're going to cover. I've got a lot of material, so uh, we're going to be moving along fairly quickly. So um, I will take questions, but I want to try and get through a lot of this information because there is so much going on in the forensic field as far as DNA analysis and actually even outside the forensic field. So I actually will touch on some of those areas also. So again, if you have questions as we're going along, uh, feel free to ask. And I'm really slow with uh, a thing. I always got to use a mouse, or I like to use a mouse. Oh, there is one. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there is one. All right. Is there, is there a thing to advance slides, or I just use my arrow key? That's fine. Okay. So again, I want, want to do an update here. Kind of this was a, a talk I've given actually the uh, county attorneys convention and the uh, judges group. But uh, first, I want to do is kind of give you a little background about DNA and what's happened uh, since actually the 80s. And again, I was around back in the early 80s in the crime lab before DNA was even um, starting. You know, before we even looked at DNA from a forensic standpoint. But uh, what I want to give you from this slide is basically identifying kind of the amount and uh, the sensitivity of the DNA testing that we started with back in the mid 80s to where we're at today, because it's dramatically different. So what I want to say is uh, when we started back in the mid 80s, when uh, Alec Jeffrey started this out, we needed, and do I have any science majors in the room? Oh, shucks, okay, well, that's, all. <laughs> that's okay. But uh, what I want to say is that we needed, so what I want to talk about is uh, the amount of DNA that we needed in a sample back then by the methodology that we were working was two micrograms. And to give you an idea, that would be a blood stain about the size of a nickel or quarter. We needed that much DNA. The other thing I want to talk about is the size of the fragments of DNA that we looked at. We needed pieces of DNA that were 20,000 bases long or 20 kilobases long. Okay, now Today, we're looking at pieces that are only like 300 or 200 bases long. So from 20,000 bases long chunks of DNA down to pieces that are only about 100 bases long. So that's you know, two big things that we have to talk about. Uh, the other thing, turnaround time. RFLP days, and I, I did this back then. Uh, we used uh, autoradiograms, uh, radioactive uh, probes. Took about six to eight weeks just to run a single sample back then, okay? That's late 80s, early 90s. Okay, into the 90s, we switched to what's called a PCR technology. And this is where really we had the dramatic uh, mushrooming of the type of testing that we could do. And the reason for that, and so this is one thing I want you to try and remember, is PCR. It stands for polymerase chain reaction. And what we can do is start out with a theoretically a single copy of target DNA that we're looking at. And through this PCR process, we can make copies of it. So it's just like a photocopy copy machine. We start out with one copy, two, four, eight, 16, 32. And by the time we're through 30 cycles with this instrument, we have between a million and a billion times more of that DNA that we, than what we started with. So that's really the power of it is that we can actually, it's like a photocopier. We can make copies of our target DNA we're looking at. So I moved my third bullet point, STR analysis. This is pretty much the standard tried and true DNA testing that you're going to see out of forensic crime labs throughout the country. Okay, it stands for short tandem repeats. And again, I don't want to get into all the super fine uh, testing or technology of this because, you know, it's semesters of coursework in molecular biology to understand all this. But again, I just want to focus on certain parts of that. But again, it started about 1999 throughout the, the US and throughout the world. And what I want to talk about now is the amount of DNA that we needed. So we went from two micrograms down to now needing less than one nanogram, one half to one nanogram. So I'm talking a thousand fold decrease in the amount of sample. So I'm going from a quarter sized blood stain down to a pinhead sized blood stain or a stain you can't even see anymore we can get DNA test, testing done off of that because of that PCR technology or that process. Again, uh, very discriminating, STR analysis, very discriminating. Um, 
So that's what we're doing today. I also today want to talk about other types of DNA testing that is available to you because uh, I've got every, people, it's a criminal law uh, seminar and there are other things that can be done outside our laboratory by private laboratories that may be amenable to specific cases that you have, especially post-conviction relief cases or certain situations like that. So one of them is called Y-STR analysis or in testing, and that is, again, STR analysis, but it only is doing it on the Y chromosome, okay, and that Y chromosome. Most of you should know that's, that's the male chromosome. You know, if you are female, you are XX. If you're male, you are XY. So the Y chromosome or the male chromosome, we're doing testing specifically on that area. And what I wanted to tell you that is that testing is sensitive down to 50 picograms. So we're now going between 100 and 1,000 fold more sensitive than the one nanogram. So we're getting really, really sensitive. Okay, so here, here's the F for the scientific notation people. So I talked to you about micrograms, that's 10 to the minus six with six zeros, point zero zero with six zeros. Nanograms, that's what our STR testing is, one nanogram, so that's 10 to the minus nine zeros. Picogram down 10 to the minus 12. So it's 12 of those zeros. So we are getting really, really sensitive. Okay, so again, talking about the different types of uh, testing out there. Uh, first of all is the autosomal STR analysis. And that, again, that is what we're doing in our laboratory. Every forensic lab in the country that is doing uh, forensic testing is doing autosomal STR testing. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about these Megaplex kits, which is just basically an increase in the amount of uh, what I will say is real estate that we're looking at and then rapid DNA at the end if, you, if we have time to cover that area. Uh, talk to you about YSTR analysis. Again, that's a techni technique or technology we're looking only at the Y chromosome. Mitochondrial DNA analysis. This is another uh, type of DNA that's present in the mitochondria and many copies in the cell. This works very well on highly degraded DNA samples. So samples like bones that have been in the, uh, the ground you know, for 20, uh, 30 years or so. Uh, also hairs that might be present in an old, uh, and we're doing this all the time, post-conviction relief cases, where we want to go back and look at a hair that was maybe present in a murder case or, or a rape case, and we want to go back and, and retest that. Most of the time, that autosomal STR analysis is not going to work just because of the age of that sample, but uh, mitochondrial DNA testing uh, most likely will be able to. Uh, the other one, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Has anybody here had Ancestry DNA or uh, 23andMe work on it? Who here is aware of those two uh, agency or companies, okay? I, I actually, my wife just convinced me to, to have myself submit a sample into it, even though you know, I, I know pretty much what's going on, but I'm an adopted child and she wants me to try and find some of my uh, natural family because I, I know nothing about my uh, natural family. So, so I sent a sample in like two weeks ago and so we'll get results back. But SNPs are specifically, and again, you'll hear about this, you're just starting to hear about this in the forensic community, but SNPs initially were not used in the forensic community because SNPs actually can determine heritable characteristics, your hair color, your eye color, your facial features, all those types of things can be determined through SNPs. So from our forensic DNA database, <coughs> technology, with, and I'll talk about CODIS later on, is that we purposely did not want to look at those areas because of the issues of privacy, the ACLU and things. We did not want to look at those areas. But now, uh, because of companies like Ancestry and 23andMe and, and other companies, because of the profitability of it, they are getting into these SNPs. And I can tell you, uh, we've had a case actually where we have used it, and I can think of other cases in the country where they have used it to try and and they have used it on a forensic sample from an unsolved murder case to determine the heritable characteristics, the eye color, hair color of that person, what that person's facial features uh, most likely could look like. Because if they can determine if you are you know, 20% Western European, 30% East Asian, 10% African American, they can actually, they're getting to the point when they keep running more and more of these SNPs, that they will be able to generate a likelihood of what your facial features would look like. So we are getting to that point with uh, these SNPs now, nowadays. The other thing, uh, next area, animal and plant DNA. Again, uh, probably not a big deal for most of you here, but uh, can be done on things like marijuana, 
strains and things like that. Actually, uh, animals, and again, for, from a breeding standpoint, we actually had a case um, where we had animal DNA on a murder case. A uh, gentleman uh, comes to another uh, individual's residence, kills the individual, and while that person is there, the victim's dog urinates on the suspect's tire. And we actually uh, identify the vehicle, uh, swab that tire, and actually are able to identify the uh, owner's or the victim's dog's DNA and put it on that tire of the suspect's vehicle. So again, you think outside the box here, this is a place where DNA, again, could be used. Next-gen sequencing, i uh, just uh, talk about that briefly. That's basically a combination of all these bullets that you see uh, above it. It can all be done in one failed swoop. Very, very expensive, but uh, we are at that point now that we can do all those in one failed swoop with this next-generation sequencing. Okay, why STR analysis? Uh, quickly, just to, to talk to you about that, um, it's very sensitive, I told you, but it's not very discriminating. So uh, if we get a YSTR uh, result, the frequency of occurrence on that sample would be about 1 in 500. Our DNA results with the STR analysis, they're out past 100 billion. We are down at about 1 in 500. But where this works well is if we have a sexual assault case where you've got victim's vaginal fluid and suspect seminal fluid, on a vaginal swab and say the uh, victim's DNA is like six parts victim, one part male uh, of the male. And what happens is when we do our PCR technology, when you run that through 30 cycles, the, vict the female DNA way out distances the male and so we can barely detect it. So here's a case where we could maybe use just YSTR analysis, focus in on just the male DNA on that vag swab and get a result. Cost, again, about 1200 bucks per sample. Uh, our new Megaplex kit. So this is what I want to talk about, the STR analysis that's used, again, throughout the country. Uh, one of the things that we were re required to do in January of 2017 was go from a uh, DNA kit or that went from 13 to 20 core loci. And what I'm talking about here are the different segments of DNA that we're looking at. Okay, before, all the way since the 90s, we had to look at 13 core loci now. We were up to 20, and the reason for that is we want to be able to use this, and I'll be talking about CODIS, for international searches. 13 was plenty for us in the U.S., but now we're using Interpol to do or conduct international searches. So that is the capability that we have today, and because, again, there's about 60 countries throughout the world that have uh, this CODIS software to allow this type of searching to take place. Now, there's lots of rules involved, and I, I got a lot of lawyers here, so you would understand that, but as far as MOUs with uh, these countries, uh, we really can do this with the G8 countries, the Western European countries right now. Uh, we have MOUs with Canada and Great Britain, but outside there, uh, there's a lot of you know legal issues with MOUs as to if you do identify this, whether or not, you know, can you extradite that person? What's gonna happen with those countries? Yes? And also, what about their, other countries that the agreement rights to Good, good, good question. So, so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not from another country. I can tell you what uh, the U.S. is doing with Interpol. What we have to do if we have a sample that we believe uh, we want searched outside of our country, say uh, Germany or something, we have to go through uh, the FBI and they will send the request to Interpol and then Interpol will make that request to the, that specific country or countries to do that search. I don't know what Germany can do to come back on us. So that, that's where those MOUs, I think, come into effect. So I don't know what MOU we have with, say, Germany or MOU we have with Belgium or whatever. What, what's going to happen if we do conduct those searches? That, that's a good question. That's, I guess, above and beyond my uh, knowledge. But thank you for that question. Okay. Um, so again, we're, we're just looking at more core loci. And the major reason for this is when we developed our STR loci in the U.S., uh, we chose our core 13, Great Britain chose their core loci, Germany chose their core loci, and nobody thought about, well, should we be using the same loci? And they didn't. So everybody was using different loci, and so we could, it's like apples and oranges, you can't compare them. So what happened is about five years ago or so at Interpol, they decided we need to, as the, the world, come together and come up with common core loci so everybody can search everybody's uh, 
databases if they so choose or if they're capable of doing that. Okay, I, I, good, good question. Okay, um, I, I do, we have not had a situation where we've had to do an international search. I can tell you out in California, they caught someone that was from Austria. We did do a, a search uh, outside and uh, caught an individual from Austria. They had left the country and they got him through their database. We had another one I know with Canada where we've gotten a hit. So again, this is fairly new stuff in the last about two years where this has been happening, but uh, it, it's happening. So I, I'm just kind of giving you this information to kind of tell you where we're going and what's going on. Okay, rapid DNA. And again, I'll get into more detail on this, but uh, typically it takes us uh, about two days to a week to, to run a sample. Uh, but uh, there are instruments now that were developed through the Department of Defense and the FBI that can get us DNA results in 90 minutes. So one stop instrument that uh, you take a buckle swab, stick it in the machine, we got results out in 90 minutes. And where this is, uh, the reason I can tell you, I know where, why this was devised, Department of Defense, if they've got individuals crossing, say, uh, borders in Afghanistan or something, you want to know, is this person possibly a terrorist? You're going to collect that sample, use this rapid instrument, and run that individual to see if maybe he's uh, a terrorist or something. Yes? What's your, what's your degree of error of this rapid response? Yeah, as opposed to... Yep, good question. This, and this is the big argument with rapid DNA. They are, we're really close. Right now, they're only using it on known specimens. Uh, we're in that developmental process right now. So we've had uh, about three instruments, actually, that uh, uh, have kind of been given the go-ahead that, again, the FBI has been looking at and actually several other, other labs around the country. But uh, we want it to get to the point where no, it, you either are going to get a result or it's going to say, eh, it failed out, we can't make a call. So uh, I'll be talking about that more a little bit later here with this talk. Okay? So one of the things is it has to meet quality assurance standards and everything. And again, the FBI is only approving this rapid DNA work on known specimens. There are laboratories and, or excuse me, some police agencies in the country that actually have these instruments and are using them on uh, question samples like burglaries and things. Uh, we do not suggest that happens because by, if you do that, then it's not available for upload to CODIS for uh, any statewide or national searching. Mitochondrial DNA analysis, I just talked about this, but uh, not very discriminating again. About one in 300 is the frequency that you will get if you uh, identify an individual. Uh, very, very expensive, about $3,200 a sample to, to run mitochondrial DNA analysis. But if you've got an old case, degraded samples, that's typically about the only chance you're going to have to get DNA testing done. SNPs, again, I talked to you about that, the ethnicity testing, why we're doing it. Again, the initial uh, workup of SNPs was done. Um, by a company down in Florida to actually identify American Indians. Uh, I don't know if any of you are aware, but I think if you are, I think it's one-fifth American Indian, you can qualify for aid from different tribal groups. Or, you know, I know, well, I have a sister and a brother uh, part of American Indian, but um, you would qualify, I know, for getting monies, you know, maybe from the casinos or something, if you can show that you are, you know, part of that tribe or whatever. So that's really kind of how some of this was started for that reason from a, what I would say from an economic standpoint or a business standpoint. Again, we do not do this in the, the crime lab. Animal plant DNA, I just talked to you about that, the, the dog issue or uh, national wildlife, they can do work on identifying, you know, rhinoceros horns, uh, different elk versus deer, all that kind of stuff. They can do the same thing that we're doing. Human-wise, they can do it with animals. Uh, next generation sequencing, again, is kind of all these different things combined. Now, I, I got to keep moving because I've got lots of uh, data to cover. One of the things, uh, again, I've got criminal people here. Everybody hears us talking about touch DNA. So what is touch DNA? So it's defined as evidence that has no visible staining and would contain DNA that only results from touching an item with the skin. Again, does not include cigarette butts, swabs from cans, bottle straws, all those different types of things where saliva would be present. So um, also does not include such things as shoes, uh, shirts or whatever. We're to the point where if you wore like a hat or like a shirt, I can get DNA off the collar of your shirt or the brim of your hat if you've worn that uh, several times. No problem, we can get your DNA from those types of samples. But uh, where people want us to do this is on crime scene samples like guns. Uh, maybe let's say somebody, uh, and I actually had samples, I had a bank robbery, uh, person, suspect touches the counter, you know, and then goes out the door, hits the push bar, going out the bank. 
And so they swab the push bar on the door going outside that bank or credit union. What do you think the problem is? And I can tell you, I can get DNA off that swab. What do you think the problem is of swabbing that push bar going out that uh, door at that bank or credit union? Lots of DNA. There's, therein lies the kicker, okay? I can almost guarantee you I'll get DNA results, but I'll get like a four, five, six person mixture, but I can't tell you anything. Same way they swab the, the counter at the, the teller's area. Same thing again. Probably he, he or she was not the only one that touched that. So again, the sensitivity is there, but we really got to keep track of where and the significance of the samples that we want to run because sometimes it could just be uh, a fruitless effort because you know it's not going to give us any uh, credible information to, to help us in solving the case. So uh, my, again, my, my big thing is uh, we want to look at samples that um, we have a good chance of getting results. And, and part of our issue here, I would like to do touch DNA on everything, but we just don't have the resources in our lab to run every touch DNA sample. So, so we've really limited uh, the number of samples that we're going to do on touch cases. Again, violent crimes only, uh, touch evidence we process only when no other probative evidence exists. Again, talk about the high traffic areas that are bad. I talked about those countertops, steering wheel of a uh, stolen car, guns. We always have these felon in possession cases, and I usually get a four or five person mixture on those guns. Yes? Okay, here, here's a good one. Uh, we got, <laughs> it always happens. We have the OWI traffic fatalities. Somebody, uh, we have two people in a car, car rolls or whatever. Somebody's dead, someone's still alive. The living person always says, oh, it was the dead person that was driving, it was not me. Okay, but the airbag deploys in the driver's side and we swab the front side of that airbag because do you think there should not theoretically be anybody else's DNA on that airbag because you know, it was all sealed up. And so that would be my perfect, perfect example. Uh, another one that uh, sometimes can be useful, maybe we've got a uh, piece of rope that was uh, used to bind and gag a, a victim in say a kidnapping or sex abuse. And so uh, obviously the part that make, comes in contact with the victim's wrist is probably gonna have the victim's DNA on it. But if I look at the ends of those strings, I got a good chance of maybe getting the assailants or the person that tied that victim up. So those are some examples of where that would be Again, something where lots of people haven't touched it. We call high traffic areas. Okay, for all of you, okay, I, nobody raised their hand to be a, uh, that said they were a, a science major here. So I just want these next two slides, I want to kind of point to you to, to give you an analogy. This was somebody from MIT that gave this to me back in 1989 about uh, DNA and chromosomes. So again, remember you got 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, 22 are called autosomal, one pair of the 23 is your sex chromosomes. Again, if you're a female, you're an XX, if you're a male, you're an XY. Uh, again, during meiosis are, you know, your eggs and the sperm, when they come together at fertilization, that's what makes you the person you are, and you get half your DNA from your mom from that egg, half your DNA from your father from the sperm, and it's that combination that makes you the person you are. Barring identical twins, everyone's DNA should be unique to them. Even, there's actually some minor differences now. We've determined even identical twins, but for most part, I would say um, only identical twins by the technology we're currently using would have the same DNA. And so here's my, this, this is the uh, analogy I was given, and this is just great. So um, DNA is made up of these bases. There's just four bases, uh, A, a G, a T, and a C. And I make this analogy to the letters of our alphabet, okay? So we got four letters in DNA. We got 26 letters in an alphabet. What do you do with the letters in the alphabet? You make words, right? You combine them to make words. In DNA, we use those bases to make amino acids. They combine to make amino acids, okay? What do you do with words? You combine them to make sentences. In the DNA field, we use amino acids to make proteins, okay? So that's your analogy right there. So then my question to you is, what happens if you change one letter in a sentence? Is that affected? It may or may not. So here was my, how serious is it if you leave out a letter or if you change one letter? So here's my basic sentence, C spot run, okay? So what if I change the R to an F, C spot fun? Does that make sense? Mm, kind of so-so. Um, what if you leave out a letter? Does that, couldn't that drastically affect the sentence? So, and you, I got lots of 
attorneys here, so you know, one word or one letter change can make a drastic difference or it can make a pretty minor difference, depending on where it's at. That's exactly what happens in DNA. Depending on where that certain base is inserted, deleted, or changed, flip-flopped with another base, can make a huge difference, like having sickle cell anemia versus not, or it might be a real minor issue and, and you don't even know that, that you had that uh, base change. So this was my best analogy I've ever seen in my, in my whole career about talking about DNA and, and changes and, and dealing with mutations in DNA. Yes? My question is sort of true, but not from a scientific background. Namely, what's the difference between sensitive and experimental? Yes. Use those words Good. Good question. Okay, sensitivity deals with how much DNA is there. Okay, I talked about two micrograms, the, the stain, that's a quarter size, down to now we're down in the picogram range. You can't even see that amount. It, it is way below what you can even see. Discrimination deals with the, what the result gives you. So discrimination, so I talked to you about YSTR analysis. If I get a YSTR uh, match, and I would say the frequency of occurrence is one in 500, unrelated individuals would have this profile and your suspect has that uh, same profile. Versus I'm doing my Megaplex SDR kit and I'm gonna say the frequency of occurrence is one in 52 nonillion, okay? And I'm gonna talk about big numbers in a minute. The number is like, I don't know, 27 zeros, okay? So, so what is more significant? One with, you know, one in 500 versus one in 30 nonillion. And, so, okay, so everything, every time we uh, report a match in DNA in the forensic field, we have to attach a statistical significance of that match because it is paramount on us to explain to the jury what is the significance of that match. Because I can say, well, their DNA match or such and such match, but what does that mean? And my best analogy there, again, is a car and a hit and run. So the uh, eyewitness says, well, it was a red car. Well, does that mean much? I don't know. Well, it was a red 1982 Ford Mustang. What? Yeah, that tells me a lot more. Well, it was a red 82 Ford Mustang with Iowa license plate ABC123. That's a lot more significant, isn't it, than I just saying it was a red car, you know. So, so that's what we try and do, or we always are required to do, is to assess a statistical significance to any match that we call with DNA. And that's also a good basis for cross-examination. Yes, by all means, yes. Okay, now I gotta hit escape. And my large number. Oh, no, I am back to my large number. Okay, so I talked to you about big numbers. Again, I told you that YSDRs or mitochondrial DNA analysis will give you a frequency of about one in 300, one in 500. We are now, with our new STR Megaplex kits, are reporting results out in the octillion and nonillion, all right? Uh, in our previous reports prior to 2017, actually some of our uh, single source profile results that you'll see in our reports, we actually, well, no, I take that back. As of January 2017, we changed them. We used to report our results if we had an association, we would say, you know, this uh, blood stain from the murder weapon matches the known DNA profile of victim Jane Doe. And the frequency of occurrence of that is fewer than one in 100 billion unrelated individuals would be expected to have that profile. And it, again, it does match our victim, okay? The reason we, we used to cut it at one in 100 billion is because most people understand what 100 billion is, okay? So you go to millions, billions, trillions, even, I will talk about our debt, I guess, the <laughs> US debt, uh, most people understand trillions. But when you get past that, and again, I'm a, I'm a scientist and I've you know, taken all this uh, science classes, but I, I get past the quadrillion, I can't keep track of how many zeros that is, okay? So, and, and this is how we are required to report these, is give that actual number. So typically when we're looking at 20 STR loci, the numbers coming out, if we get a full profile, are typically in that octillion or nonillion range, all right? And does anybody here, did anybody here before looking at this know what a nonillion was? I certainly, and I can tell you, I, I, I still can't keep track that a nonillion is 30 zeros, okay? But we have to explain that to a jury and what does a nonillion mean? So I, a lot of times we will probably be putting this up in, or else explain to them how many more zeros that is 
past, say, a, a billion or a trillion. <coughs> because, again, the numbers are that discriminating these days. Oop, oh, right on time. So. Okay, next I want to talk to you about and this was a talk I actually did uh, last summer at the County Attorney's Convention, um, dealing with changes uh, in our reports and the reason for those changes, okay? So what I'm gonna have here, I have the PowerPoint, I'm gonna give you some sample case scenarios. And what happens is um, when we get DNA results, we can either get a single source profile, that's the greatest, uh, results for us, again, that blood stain off the murder weapon that matches our victim's DNA profile. That's easy peasy for us. We're going to report that result, one in, you know, 32 known alien. But what happens is many times, and I just talked to you about those, um, uh, that bank robbery situation, when we get mixtures, okay? Mixtures are a big problem for us in trying to elucidate or decipher who is in there. So maybe I've got a three-person mixture, and I want to know, could our suspect be in that mixture? Here's our classic example. We've got a rape case. Uh, we run the victim's vaginal swab, but information we have is the victim had had consensual intercourse with boyfriend or husband eight hours before the sexual assault. So we run that sexual assault vaginal swab. We get a three-person mixture. Now, the one person we are pretty sure we know is going to be on there is our victim's DNA because it's the victim's vaginal swab. So we would expect that victim's DNA to be present there but we have uh, a suspect and then we have a possible consensual partner. And if we don't have, say, either the suspect or the consensual partners known, then it gets really uh, problematic for us to attempt to decipher or determine the significance of that mixture. And I'll be going through some examples here in just a little bit to talk about that. But, but so what, what I would tell you then is this, uh, the one in, you know, 32 known alien or whatever, that's called random match probability, RMP. But those situations where we get the mixtures, in the past we used a different statistical approach called com combined probability of index, all right? And so uh, we've used that for actually decades, but at the national level, and we had a, a very unique way of doing it, a very conservative method on dealing with mixtures with CPI statistics. But uh, what they're saying nationally is that, and actually internationally, is that you should go away from CPI and look at what's called probabilistic genotyping in order to report your results. And with, by doing that, you're using likelihood ratios. Anybody here a, a big math whiz know about likelihood ratios? So I, I, spent about, <laughs> I spent about two weeks just learning about likelihood ratios in the last year and a half with training uh, dealing specifically with likelihood ratios. And again, this is a, a website you can go to. Uh, we purchased a, a software program from a, a company out of New Zealand, and uh, it's probably the, the most popular, the biggest uh, software program that's being used throughout the United States and throughout the world uh, called SDR Mix. And there's the website. And again, that's, I just want to know, this is where I'm getting a lot of this information you'll see in this uh, PowerPoint, giving them credit, because this was part of the presentation they give us uh, for training to get us online with using this software. So why do we do this? Again, I talked to you about the FBI, FBI requiring us to switch, whoa, uh, switch from 13 to 20 core loci by January 1st of 2017. We did that. Um, again, that was for the international searching with Interpol. But as a result to this new Megaplex kit, which is called, called Global Filer, which is actually 21 loci we're looking at, um, is that we had to change our statistical program that we were using. Again, I used to be looking at 13 loci, now I'm up to 20. We had an in-house Excel program that we used to calculate our statistical values. Uh, it was actually created by my former supervisor, a great program, but uh, he had to input all these statistical frequencies for all these different uh, allele calls and stuff. And so we had the 13 done, or actually 15 of those done, but the actual additional five or eight that we added, we didn't have that software program or that Excel program developed to, to input all that additional data. So we said at this point in time, because I didn't want to do it and I didn't feel capable of doing that. And so I said, we're going to go with an, an off the shelf uh, commercially developed program that again has been uh, shown to be 
uh, validated and used in other laboratories throughout the country and the world. Okay, the other reason, there was a President's Council of Advisors, PCAST, uh, that was a, a group under the Obama administration uh, that uh, looked at this and their two findings, well, in finding three, I want to show you. So looking at that bottom arrow, it says DNA analysis of complex mixtures should move rapidly to more appropriate methods based on probabilistic gen genotyping. And then the first one talks about CPI methods and that it's not such a great way to, to use it if it's not used correctly and therefore um, you should be going to probabilistic genotyping. And so that's what we are doing based on the recommendations uh, at the national level. So as a result, what happened? Okay, our current in-house statistical program was out the window, couldn't be used. Uh, so we had to purchase this, uh, well, program called STR Mix. But in the meantime, in that interim period, before we got STR Mix online, we had to purchase another program called Armed Expert that allowed us to deal with uh, calculating those frequencies. Yes? So you're sitting there on the stand, I smile at you and say, so you have an interactional program, right? And you go, well, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, again, it, it was a record. How have you dealt with that sure. transition? Yeah, good question. So because, it, because you've got people saying what you were doing before is wrong. Okay. I, what I would tell them is what we were doing before was not wrong. It was not incorrect. It, it was, again, what I would tell you on those single source profiles, not an issue. Everything that we're doing is valid, uh, is still valid. We're still reporting out RMP statistics on those single source profiles. For the mixtures, however, we chose, and we we're one of two labs in the country that chose a very conservative approach to deal with those mixtures. We report out a frequency of, say, one in 500. It's not one in, you know, uh, an O'Neillian, it was, or one in 50, and this person could be included in that. Uh, what we're saying is we're going along with the recommendations of uh, PCAST or, or the federal, the feds, I guess. Uh, ironically, that, uh, this just kills me, but, you know, they had this PCAST report come out. Uh, it goes, uh, we have a new president comes in. Uh, Jeff Sessions basically <coughs> dropped funding for PCAST and says, we're not going to do this anymore. So we're kind of like, well, I don't know. But it was still a recommendation under the Obama administration. What? What's that? <laughs> no. Okay, but but what I would tell you. Yes. Okay. What I would tell you is based on the recommendations nationally and what's happening across the country, we have chosen to choose a new statistical methodology in dealing with reporting out mixture results, and that. And again, what we did before was foundationally valid, but this is where the country and the, the world is going with reporting these results. This likelihood ratio has been done um, in uh, Australia. Uh, Great Britain has done it for, for actually probably a decade before us, or maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 uh, labs, oh, maybe more than that, uh, prior to this changeover, this recommendation, where other labs in the country were already using likelihood ratios. So, it's just an international rationalization of everybody doing the same thing, not necessarily a recognition of we haven't been doing what they have been doing the greatest. Yeah, that, that, that could be. Yeah, that, you know, that's your interpretation of why. You know, again, we're, we're just trying to follow. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yep. This it's is not a new a situation where you think it's a viable attack. No, I, I would say not. And there are other software programs out here that can do this besides this SDR mix. But uh, again, it's based on recommendations nationally. You know, we have our own accrediting bodies, and that's what everybody's saying. You should be moving this way. All right. Uh, again, this likelihood ratio uh, reporting is really a paradigm shift from what we've been doing before with that CPI. Uh, Deals with, again, complex mixtures, low-level touch DNA samples, and degraded samples. These, these are the samples, again, problematic samples, where we would be using probabilistic genotyping to report out these results. Does not need to be used with simple two-person mixtures where you can assume a donor. So typically, if we have a, a two-person mixture, vaginal swab with semen on it, and uh, we see a two-person mixture, but we know, you know it's a vaginal swab, so we can subtract out the victim's DNA profile from that, and then we can elucidate out the semen donor if it's just a two-person mixture. So those situations, it's a non-issue. It's again, where we have the mixtures that we deal with probabilistic genotyping. Okay, talk about RMP and that again, it's been used 
long times and, and then kind of how we reported results are. Move on from here. CPI again is what we used to do. Results again, frequent, frequencies of less than one in a thousand typically. And uh, basically CPI is a probability that a person would be included, not excluded, on based on straight allele presence. So it's a three person mixture and we say this person could be included in this three person mixture. And the frequency of occurrence would be say one in 500 or one in 50. Okay, so I want to give you, or how are we doing? Okay, pretty good. Three examples of uh, a likelihood ratio situation. And again, we're not quite there yet. By the, before the end of the year, we will be reporting out mixtures with this type of report. Uh, so typically what you have to have is a hypothesis, a conclusion, and a verbal scale as to the significance of that association uh, with that mixture. Okay, so typically what we're gonna have is a, a H1's a prosecution hypothesis, and that would be say the DNA originated from the person of interest. Uh, hypothesis for the defense would be the DNA originated from someone else. So it's gotta be a this or that. It's okay, that's likelihood ratios. It's either gotta be this, and it's not that, and it's gotta be the other. Okay, all likelihood ratios must, having, must have opposing proposition. The setup of these opposing propositions are critical in generating the proper likelihood ratio. And I, I have to focus on that. You have to have the right uh, propositions or your likelihood ratio doesn't mean anything. At least one assumption must be made for the specific calculation. And that would be that I've got a three person mixture or I've got a five, four person mixture or I've got a five person mixture. I have to make, draw that assumption before I do my likelihood ratio calculation. So, and this is how the report will come out then. It says based on the DNA typing results obtained, it is gonna be say, 200 quadrillion times more likely if the observed DNA profile from the evidence originated from John Doe and two unknown contributors than it originated from three unrelated unknown contributors. So it's, it's our John Doe and two unknown people or it's three unknown people. So you always have to set up that uh, proposition correctly. Yes? Is that going from the first one? Is that round repeat later than most scientists would? That's nope. pretty much... I, I, what I'm saying is I'm going to put a number in there, but I just want to show you. With my examples, I'll put a number in there. Is this something that's been debated as to what that number is, or is it basically something that's kind of You're going to see that here in my next few slides, okay? okay? So the analysis provides, and this is where we're going into the statistical report or whatever, it's going to be strong, very strong, or weak support, or doesn't support that, that John Doe is a contributor to the DNA profile developed from, say, the... I don't know, vaginal swab or the, the gut. So here's my examples. And so I talk about that strength of association. Here it is, what we're gonna say. If you have a likelihood ratio of zero, it's exclusion. One to 99, we're gonna basically say it's uninformative, doesn't mean anything. And then we just keep moving up, okay? So if it's greater than a 10,000 likelihood ratio, we're gonna say it's a very strong association. And what I would tell you is typically, when we're using this software, the, the numbers are either gonna be very low or they're gonna be out in like the quadrillion. So, and again, I don't know, how, how do you, you know, we're trying to give a jury this information if you have a likelihood ratio of say a thousand or say a hundred, what does that mean? So again, we're just laying it out here from a statistical standpoint, the significance of that association. So one of the things I wanna show you is, is you can get messed up with these uh, uh, assumptions here. So here's my example where you could confuse the probability of the evidence given a specific hypothesis with the pri probability of that hypothesis itself. So here's my first example. So there is a high probability that an animal has four legs if it is an elephant, okay? That was the uh, probability that we wanted to show here. But what if we said, so there's a very high probability that an animal is an elephant if it has four legs. Is that the same thing? No, it's not. So we gotta be very careful that we get these hypotheses uh, correct, or you're gonna, you know, uh, be giving a likelihood ratio of the wrong thing, and it, it doesn't mean squat. So it's, it's real important that we get this correct. So again, uh, this this software has been used again, and it's admissible, and I can show you. And there's lots more stuff as far as in these courts and these cases all over the, the country. Okay, 17 labs are using this right now. 55 labs. We're one of those 55 labs in the stages of installing this. Uh, software right now in our uh, state lab. Our plans again to have this online this year yet, uh, we're still completing validation with that. Um, 
So I want to go that. Uh, what else? PG software taking us longer time. This is just basically about backlog here. What I want to do is get to those examples here, um, those uh, report examples. So did I click? Uh oh, where's my? Huh. Got to into the wrong thing there, I think. Oops. Oh, I see myself now. <laughs> I clicked off. I didn't hit the big bar, but sorry. That's okay. Okay. Uh, where's my e drive? Where you local drive? There it is. Okay. okay. No, is that it? Spreadsheet? No, that's not it. There they are. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I apologize. Didn't click happy. Okay, can you guys see that okay? So our first example here, I don't know how I can switch this to a single page, but uh, so we have a cutting from a hat band of a baseball hat left at a robbery, and the assumption was made that the DNA profile was a mixture from three individuals. Okay, that's my assumption. It's a three-person mixture. So our first hypothesis, prosecution hypothesis, John Doe, our suspect, and two unrelated unknown contributors comprise this mixture versus Three unrelated unknown contributors comprise this mixture. Okay, we run the results. Here's our conclusion. Based on the DNA typing results obtained, it is 57 octillion times more likely if the observed profile from the baseball hat band originated from John Doe and two unrelated individuals versus three unknown contributors. On the verbal scale, and this is what would be in a report, the analysis provides very strong support that John Doe was a contributor to the DNA profile developed from that baseball hat. Okay, that's kind of how we're going to have our reports coming out. Just showing the whole page. Okay, uh, second example. Swabbing of a knife handle from an assault, and the assumption was made that the DNA profile was a mixture from four individuals. A known buckle swab is submitted from Andrew Doe, our suspect, William Smith, our victim. And they were submitted as reference samples, so we've got those to look at. No other suspects have been identified or developed in the case. So hypothesis A, Andrew Doe and three unrelated individuals are comprise this mixture versus four unrelated unknown individuals comprise this mixture. So first conclusion, based on the DNA typing results, it is at least 1.2 times more likely if the observed DNA profile originated from Andrew Doe and three unrelated unknown contributors than if it originated from four unknown contributors. So is that a very high number? Well, let's go to our verbal scale. The analysis of the knife handle swabs and with regards to Andrew Doe, with, excuse me, Andrew Doe is uninformative, okay? 1.2 likelihood ratio, really not very much information there, okay? Let's look at the other option then at our hypothesis. William Smith and three unrelated unknown individuals comprise this mixture versus four unrelated unknown people comprise the mixture. So conclusion, based on the DNA typing results obtained, it is at least 110 quadrillion times more likely if the observed DNA profile originated from William Smith and three unrelated unknown individuals than four unrelated unknown individuals. So whose blood do you think is, is really there in that mixture? If you were a juror, who do you, or are you gonna you know, hang your hat on? William Smith or Andrew Doe? Based on likelihood ratios, who's more likely in that mixture? I got you totally confused. No? Nope? Okay, it should be William Smith, right? Yeah, this analysis provides very strong support that William Smith is a contributor to the profile, all right? Again, just based on numbers here. My last example here is, again, just an example. Vaginal swabs in a sexual assault kit. Assume the DNA profile originated from three individuals. Victim was assumed to be there. Uh, known buckle swab from Jane Doe's victim. Buckle swab from Steve Smith. Suspect are submitted. We do not have a known from Jim Jones, our victim uh, consensual partner. So the DNA types are a mixture. So our hypothesis here, can I get this down? Ooh, oh, do I go to another page here? So our hypothesis, the DNA types are a mixture of the victim and the suspect and one unknown, unknown unrelated individual versus the DNA types are a mixture of the victim and two unknown unrelated contributors. So let's see, where do I? slide down here. I think that's it. Okay, conclusion. Based on the DNA typing results obtained from the vaginal swab, it is at least 24 quadrillion times more likely it originated from Jane Doe, 
Steve Smith and one unknown unrelated individual, then it originated from the victim and two unknown unrelated individuals. This analysis provides very strong support that the suspect is a contributor to the DNA profile developed from the vaginal swab. So does that kind of make sense to you given those three examples? And I think I actually missed a PowerPoint. So, so far does everything I've said make sense? Yes. a defendant and he says it wasn't me it was my brother We're oh a full, good a full brother here let's yes say. Like good brother. question holy cow that is i'm gonna have to go with a totally different hypothesis setup and that's going to require uh me to know that uh prior to that time uh I, i've got we've got all these special computers running this software and if i've got some of these complex mixtures with with uh familial situations it could take hours to crunch out this uh, statistical uh, result from that, but I would need to know that in advance so I could set that up as my alternate hypothesis that it's, you know, this mixture includes, you know, Jim Smith versus this mixture, Jim Smith and two other people versus Jim Smith's brother and two individuals, uh, unrelated unknown individuals. Yes, that's a very good question. And we would need to know that ahead of time in order to, uh, figure out uh, the opposing hypotheses in that yeah, situation. And a, and a similar thing would be saying, I have brother or Yes, or yep, yep. So those, those situations can happen. And so we've got to know that in advance if we're gonna calculate out those hypotheses. I can't just do that in the courtroom, uh, you know, winging it when I'm testifying at trial. Uh, I need the jail school. Sorry, I got going here. Oops. So do we shut off at uh, four o'clock online, uh, Christine? Because I got 158. <laughs> can, can I go a little bit? I, I apologize. I totally forgot about this. I got Roland and uh, Mrs. PowerPoint. So I want to talk to you about CODIS. Who here knows about CODIS? Anybody? Okay, I've got just a couple hands. So CODIS is a, a software program that allows us uh, searching. It's, it's just basically a big software program that allows searching of DNA sample databases against each other. Classic example would be evidence from a crime scene, develop a DNA profile. We upload that into CODIS in our what we call our unknown database. We also have what's called a convicted offender database. And those are individuals required to provide DNA samples to our lab and we can search these question profiles against those convicted offender profiles. Okay, CODIS stands for the Combined DNA Index System. It's a three-tiered software program that's at the federal level, the state level, and can be at a local level. Here in Iowa, since we only have one state crime lab, we just have the state level and the national level. If you're in Missouri, uh, St. Louis PD, Kansas City PD, St. Louis County all have local laboratories. They upload their DNA results to the state lab in Jeff City, Missouri, and then that data then goes up nationally to the FBI out in Quantico, Virginia. So again, why do we have it? Assist criminal justice agencies by developing investigative leads. Link offenders profiles to crime scenes, victims, and other evidence, deter future, future criminal acts. So actually we have this many databases in there. Most people only hear of the forensic database and what we call the offender database. Now we in Iowa have uh, our offender database is only for individuals convicted of crimes. And currently in Iowa, it's uh, felonies, sex crimes, and most aggravated misdemeanors. If you are convicted of those, you are required to provide a DNA sample to our laboratory. Many states, over 30 states in the nation, have arrestee legislation. So if you are arrested for specific crimes, you have to provide a DNA sample to their laboratory to go in their database. Say New York, if you're arrested for anything, you go into their database. Okay, other states, it's like, you know, it's a felony arrest, uh, maybe, a, I don't know, aggravated misdemeanor arrest. And, and again, every state uh, varies uh, slightly. We, we, they tried to pass a, or propose a, a law last year, a bill uh, did not make it through for us going to arrest you legislation, did not go through. But also present in that, those CODIS, database, CODIS databases are uh, a missing persons database, a relatives of missing persons database, and an unidentified human remains database. And so this deals with, what if I have a body that I find out in rural Western Iowa, and it's been there 15 years, we have no idea who it is, all right? So we can uh, run some DNA testing on that, and that would go into our 
UHR unidentified human remains uh, database. But what if I've got uh, a family out in, let's say, oh, yeah, I think that Western Iowa, uh, yeah, Glenwood, okay? And they said, well, you know, my daughter was uh, 15 years old and ran away, you know, 20 years ago, and we never saw her again, you know? But we don't know if that's her or not. So what you can do is, if you are a family member that has a missing person, you can provide your DNA sample into that uh, relatives of missing persons database, and sometimes that could help us maybe solve a crime, okay? Or that body that's out in the desert in Las Vegas, and it's actually Jane Doe from Glenwood, Iowa. So that's why we have that uh, present there. And then missing persons database, again, Jane Doe came up missing from Glenwood. Maybe we have a personal effect from her, a toothbrush or something that we know just her DNA, her hairbrush, that just her DNA is on that. And so we can put that in the missing persons database. So if again, we find those unidentified human remains at a later time, we can tie those back together again. Okay. Uh, Again, all the only thing, data that I can see in our database when we profile samples are individuals in our convicted offender database and the profiles of the forensic profiles that we develop from crimes. I cannot see what state of Illinois, state of Nebraska has in their database. People always ask me that. No, I do not have access to that. Okay, and I'll just go quickly. These are the, uh, how the law changed over the years, 05 when we expanded to uh, all felonies and sex crimes, 14 when we went to aggravated misdemeanors. This was the, kind of the law changes that went, and these are kind of the, what happened. Uh, I, you guys are all attorneys, so you can go to this uh, uh, on the expansion of the law. This is chapter 81 of the code that identifies the biggest expansion we had was the aggravated misdemeanor expansion. So it applies to crimes committed after July 1st of 2014 by a person 18 years of age or older. Again, a juvenile convicted as an adult for an aggravated misdemeanor should not be collected. So. Again, the other thing about this, it's not retroactive. Back in the, the previous slide, the uh, uh, felony and sex crime convictions, that went retroactive. So if you were uh, convicted prior to the, the start of that law, we can go back and collect you on those samples. Yes? So you favor uh, the collection of data from a juvenile offender and not from the convicted of crime? Is that your position? Or do you have a public position? I, I do not have a public position. I, I, I have basically do what you know, the, the legislature tells me. I, what, here's, here's what I can tell you. So uh, back in, what was it, 14, when we made that switch, there, there, there's two thoughts of, of, I don't know, of reasoning here. So a lot of states says, we want to go to arrest you legislation because, uh, you know, this person that's arrested, he could have committed a rape or a murder, and we'll get him at, at arrest time if, if, if he or she is not convicted of that crime. Obviously, the bigger the database is, the more chance you have of getting hit, correct? So our state says, let's, let's not go at arrest, let's go to expanding the uh, list of convictions. And so we went to aggravated misdemeanor to expand our database rather than go to arrestee legislation. The issue with some states, and again, depends on how it's written, is some states, if you have those individuals arrested and they're never convicted of a crime, you have to expunge that sample, okay? And my point is, why should I spend $500 and all our time to uh, run that sample, put it in the database, and then six months later, kick it back out again. Now, that's a lot of time and resources that I have spent that, you know, is not, in my opinion, you know, a wise use of our state resources. So that's why we've really kind of focused on uh, conviction-based uh, legislation. You know, we expanded our database. We almost doubled our, our database going from the felony uh, sex crime convictions to the aggravated misdemeanor convictions. And I can tell you, we're getting more hits as a result. All right? And I think that's mostly what I want to have. The only thing I'm, you know, I can give you some cases here. We'll talk about that at the end, but um, show you the reason we do this. This is showing you, because I know I'm at, yep, 205, uh, where we've gotten hits. So we've gotten hits in Iowa. Again, realize this database can do searches in state and out of state. We're searching all 50 states, uh, offenders, all 50 states, uh, forensic profiles on a daily basis. Okay, this is happening on a daily basis. I get hit results coming back every day on this. And so we can get forensic forensic hits. So a rape case in Iowa hits against a rape case in Illinois, or my rape case in Iowa hits against an offender in Illinois, or vice versa, their uh, offender, or excuse me, uh, their rape case in Minnesota hits against one of our offenders in Iowa. So that, again, those searches are taking place on a daily basis. But here's what we've gotten as of December 17, the number of hits. We've got almost 6,700 hits, forensic hits, and uh, 114,000 uh, 
offender hits against hitting against our offenders. Uh, at the national level, again, uh, there's been over 800,000 forensic profile hits. Uh, there's, uh, excuse me, not hits, there's that many, excuse me, I take that back. These are how many profiles we have in there right now. 114,000 offenders, 6,000 forensic samples, and below is what they have at the national level. Here's what we've got for hits that have taken place to help us solve crimes. 116, Bergs, 227, sex offenses, down the line there. This is hits by county, showing you where, you know, these hits are taking place. And then lastly, at the national level, this is where our, our hits are happening, okay? So I gotta stop, because I apologize, I, I'm going over time-wise, um, and I don't know our, if we got shut off, did we get shut off? Um, probably did, so, so I, I gotta cut it off here, but uh, if you have questions, I can use some examples. I know there are people online are probably off the, the radar now, but uh, that, that's pretty much what I've got, and I can give you a couple examples of why these hits are so important. Okay, do I have more questions, first of all? Only one. Yes. Are there, do you look at peer critiques? Are there peer critiques of your most current uh, software? What do you mean as far as peer critiques? Everybody buys the new software, yes. right? It's yeah. there. Yeah. It's so easy. Yep. Okay. Yep. Who critiques that software? Well, Where's okay. the peer review? You know, in yes. terms of yes. the Dalbert type yeah. thing. Sure. Yep. Where is the peer critique? The peer reviews are going to be in the, our forensic journals. Okay. There's there's peer reviews taking place on that, uh, both nationally and internationally. Again, because this is this is out of New Zealand. This software is out of New Zealand. Okay. We will do internal validation of this, and that's what we are working on. Have been actually for about the last four months is internal validation where we're putting in known forensic profiles and doing those searches and, and actually creating um, pseudo mixtures in-house and seeing how those are, are working. So, so we're gonna do internal validations. There's validations that have taken place, you know, other, what is it, those 55 states or whatever across the country that are doing the same thing that we are doing. That's just all from an accreditation standpoint. We are required to do those types of validations and uh, that peer uh, review is taking place. Okay, so last thing I just want to give you, and I don't know we're offline, but uh, some examples of why this is important. Uh, we had a, a gentleman by the name of Andy Six. Anybody here from the Etobicoke area? No? Okay, in 1987, I, I was just starting the lab, uh, goes to a, a farm residence uh, to buy a, a truck from a, the family with another individual. Um, he, they beat up the father, they slash the mother's throat, they raped the teenage daughter while she's there and abduct a 12-year-old little girl, younger daughter, from there. Okay, they head to Texas, they kill that little girl, dump her in Missouri, and get caught in Texas. All right, so because it's crossing state lines, uh, Andy Six is executed in 1997 in Missouri for that crime. Okay, uh, we're running cold samples, so when he goes in the database, um, because he's a convicted felon or whatever in Missouri, and we get a hit on him from a 1984 triple homicide down in the same area. 1984, we are solving this crime uh, two years ago, all right? And I can give you other examples of cases like that. But this is the power of the DNA CODIS database, because once that profile goes in there, that forensic profile or that convicted defender's profile, it's in there always and it's getting searched every day. And you never know when you're gonna solve crimes in the future, okay? So that's it. I'm sorry I went 10 minutes over, but I want to thank you very much.